So, some of you may have been expecting to see Josh Grant here from Rock U. Um, Josh had to be called away at the last second, so I'm filling in for him. However, my background is somewhat appropriate for this topic. I'm uh, currently the uh, general manager and executive producer for The Walking Dead Social Game uh, from AMC, based on the television show, which will be coming out this summer. And I've got a lot of experience when it comes to Hollywood IP and licenses and how it's been applied to gaming, not just more recently on social or on mobile, but also in the past when it comes to console titles or PC titles. So let's jump in. We're going to talk about why they're coming in here. And it's interesting. If you've been in the industry a long time, the reasons pr haven't changed that much over time. It's really more the usual suspects um, only we wearing uh, a new set of clothing. In this case, it happens to be more mobile and, and it comes to portable. We'll talk a little bit about how. This is interesting to me because in large respects, Hollywood, and when I say Hollywood, I also mean television companies or anyone with entertainment IP are entering this category in a little bit different way than they did back in the days when it came to console titles or, or PC titles or handheld games like, like Game Boy. And then lastly, why should you care? You guys are probably all mostly on the developer publisher side. Some of you might be in the brand side and, and owners of IPs. So we can talk a little bit about at the end about how those apply to these various categories. I think all uh, pop culture brands for entertainment always want to be on the cutting edge of whatever's happening inside of the, the landscape, and it's no difference in this case where you see the emergence first of the, the social networks uh, more recently, and then uh, mobile uh, and portable, which I kind of lump together as being sort of part of that same sort of uh, social ecosphere. Uh, and when I talk throughout this presentation, I'll sometimes refer to one or the other, but often what I'm saying replies to both portable and on the, on the mobile side as well. Now, what do these people want? Why are they doing this? Well, sometimes it's for marketing. Sometimes they're trying to promote their brand or trying to, make a, uh, trying to uh, uh, let people gain awareness or, or drive people to come uh, um, interact with some launch they're having of some movie or some television show. And of course, business always plays a part also. And I think this is the most important part when it comes to free-to-play and in this kind of market. Lloyd previously talked about free -to how important free-to-play was to this industry. And what I personally love about free-to-play is that it, it means that because there's no charge to play this game, that you have to really like it. So even if we have a fantastic brand, what it means is these games have to be good now. In the past, with console games in the old days, or particularly kid brands, some companies were playing a little fast and loose with their brands. They're just throwing them out there to make a fast buck. But these days, to be successful, you actually have to make a good game in addition to having a good IP. And I think for anyone who likes games uh, or appreciates the industry, it's actually great for the evolution of the industry as far as, as, far as what we're doing. So let's talk about how technology has changed stuff to some degree. Um, Time up on mobile, time up on internet, everyone's heard this before, not as much up on television. What I, I think actually is the most important thing on this slide is, TV's always been number one. Well, for at least probably, what, the last 50 years, television has been the most dominant form of entertainment for what people are, how people are consuming um, entertainment. But if you look at this trend we're talking about, and again, internet and mobile are kind of interrelated as far as downloading content and viewing it, what it says is next year, for the first time, internet and mobile will actually be bigger than TV, the combination. People are actually consuming more content that way than they are on television. So there's this finally we're passing this fundamental shift in how people are consuming uh, entertainment media. And it's also been somewhat democratizing because it's now spread out across more types of, uh, of, uh, of uh, delivery vehicles. And this one's showing also with mobile, how that same thing is going on, of course, at the expense of some of the more older, more old school forms of uh, media delivery systems like newspapers or like magazines. This one I thought was fun too. The, uh, you're looking at that big red line, our apps being, being uh, downloaded on, um, on iOS versus the blue line showing how songs have, have, have which were the, you know, initially the big driver for iOS, have been so dramatically overtaken by the rate that people are um, downloading apps 
uh, for uh, iOS. And I think that this is sort of representative. You could, this could have been an an not Android slide or, or other forms, just showing about how apps and games have, been so, have become so prevalent and so dominant. And finally, what's the other big interest they have here is that, well, if you own a brand, like a, like a television show or, or a movie, movie license, you want people to interact with them. Now, this, I'm cheating on this slide a little bit because I'm not talking about DVD sales or going into syndication, but it's really to make this larger point that, say, even something as big as Big Bang Theory, which will have 9 million viewers a week, top-rated show, 22 minutes a week of viewing, means you get almost 200 minutes of million minutes of passive viewing minutes you know, per week versus something like Avenger Alliance, which is a big popular Facebook game, which has 1.5 million DAU, so 30 minutes, you do the math, you come up with a number that's actually bigger, and this is actively, people are actively you know, in, involved with the brand. And you can see that if you had this kind of participation within a license or an IP, obviously it's going to have some level of interest on people who are creating you know, the content itself. So how are they doing it? Well, first off, I just went around the office and started asking people if they knew of games, say, on Facebook. We use that as an example, where there was something involved with an entertainment ID, IP, and we came up with this list. Now, it's not exhaustive, not every single possible one that's out there, but it's the ones that came to mind immediately to us that we were aware of or had heard of, that someone had tried to make a Facebook game at some point. Now, there's a lot of these on the list when I, when I heard someone say, oh, there, there's a blank blank game, and I won't, I won't call them out. I say, wow, I don't remember seeing that Facebook game. And then they would explain to me that it came and went in about two or three months, and it really didn't last, really didn't survive. And if you think about it, this is another example of, unless the game is really good, it's really not going to survive. The really good games actually did survive up there. Some of them that didn't survive were when you actually go look at them, you could tell they were driven by some marketing department that said, I'm going to go out, I'm going to fill up a checkbox on my marketing plan, I'm going to make a $25,000 Facebook game and just throw it out there. And nothing happens. It doesn't really work. I will say that we're spending a lot of time in our company talking to entertainment companies, and we're seeing a lot less of this happen. I think they're really, really beginning to realize the value of having a very strong, powerful game that doesn't, doesn't have a negative impact on their, IP, on their IP, and they're really actively trying to work with us to try to make really, really good games. So how, oh, so here's the other ones. So it's marketing and branded. Here's some examples of people who have uh, done that before. And I'm, mix, again, mixing in movies and, movies and television on them. So on the marketing side, there are sometimes it's extending the marketing effort. If you're coming out with a brand new launch of a movie, you might want to try to intersect with a game in, in association with it. There's all kinds of viral activity going on. People love buzz when you're in Hollywood. You're talking about marketing campaigns, so to drive that buzz, really, there's not much that can continually drive that kind of constant buzz that a game uh, that's uh, successful or, or well talked about. And then again, it's just collecting all the standard data that, uh, that a marketer would be particularly interested in. So, oh, okay, Morel Wire. It's supporting a launch, we can leverage it or we can just keep brands active. So that's the kind of ways you can apply it. So let's look at one. Here's Avengers, uh, the Avengers game, which came out about two months before the launch. And you can see, and Avengers is a well-known brand. It didn't actually need the movie, and the movie didn't need the game, certainly. But the game came out about two months before the launch. This is not a coincidence. I mean, these are obviously time to take advantage of each other. And then you can see how it taught the second life after the, after the movie came out and it continued to uh, pop up in terms of its, its, uh, its uh, uh, viewership. Versus something like Hunger Games. So this is interesting too. I mean, the Hunger Games comes out like a week or so after the launch of the movie. So you might ask yourself, well, what's the point of this then? Is it this to drive, to drive from cross-promotional marketing? It's coming after the movie, not beforehand. And this is one of the hottest you know, marketing events in the year when the movie came out. So obviously not, or you wouldn't launch it afterwards. Now, I don't, I don't want to speak to the actual intentions of this case, and the game, you know, did fairly well um, out of the gate Any, anyway, in spite of that. But I'm saying, in this particular case, this, this is something else was going on. They weren't necessarily looking to try to synergize the movie marketing and, and the game marketing uh, together. And I toss up Prime City mainly because it's, in my mind, probably the biggest example of a TV license that's done extremely well. I mean, you look at the longevity up there, and we're talking around two years for a TV Facebook game. 
I, that's, that's, that's pretty incredible. That's pretty, pretty successful. And also down the business side. So what can they do? Well, they're looking for new revenue streams like monetization through digital goods. We all know about, about free to play. We're talking about now for about sponsorships um, at Rock U. We do a large number of uh, brands that want to integrate into our games, whether the games be licensed games or sometimes original games, but they want to coexist with them. Um, they could be product placements or they can run ads, uh, like either banner ads or sort of video ads. And I think what we've discovered at Rock U is that by combining just the traditional digital goods with all these advertising opportunities, you get a far, far faster return on investment. You, 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 the hurdle rates for you to be successful are a lot lower. So I'm, I think when Lloyd here was, before was talking about how you cannot run a game based on advertising alone, he's, he's absolutely right. It's very, very hard to, to, to run a successful uh, free-to-play game or, or game, social game that is only based on advertising. But I'd also say it's a lot easier to run a free-to-play game with microtransactions if you also have advertising built into it because you don't, have to, you, don't, you don't have to need as many whales. You don't have to drive as many transactions if you're also monetizing all those people who aren't spending money inside your game. So let's look at some examples of uh, how we've done it at DeRocku in terms of tying in with entertainment IP. Well, first, what are we doing? Well, when it comes to advertising, we're offering display ads, we're doing video ads, and we're doing integrations. So integrations meaning some big brand wants to be part of, of your, your game, and there's somehow an a in-game promotion that's been put together. We did this for uh, Nescafe in terms of offering you know, coupons inside the game. And then we recently did this for uh, Zoo World. So here's an example inside of the Zookeeper game, cross promoting with the Zoo World game, a very natural one, obviously, where we could satisfy the needs of the studio as far as tying in with videos and, and trailers and tying in with the DVD launch. And then they're also satisfying you know, the needs of the brand by having some excitement inside the game that makes sense within the Zoo World context. Now, everybody keeps asking me about Walking Dead, Walking Dead all the time. So I figured we'll throw a few slides up here talking a little bit about Walking Dead. It's, it hasn't launched yet, so I can't talk too much about it. But it does show some examples of how you know, Rock U uh, approaches uh, the, the entertainment side of the, of the picture. First off, for those who don't know, it's a TV series that um, has a huge, huge following. It was actually the highest rated cable show of uh, for the uh, season two finality for an original series on, on cable. So uh, extremely, extremely pop popular. And uh, there are a lot of uh, sponsors actually behind the show. I mean, a lot of times people sponsor television shows. So these are also people that we'll be talking to on, on the Rocky side. But at the top of this, it says AMC Rocky Partnership. And I want to dwell on that a little bit because this is the other big shift that I've seen for entertainment companies and, and publishers. This particular game is not a classic, oh, the company went, we, took, we made a license deal with the, with, the, uh, with the IP owner, we run off, we make the game, we send them a royalty check. This literally is a partnership. AMC is deeply involved in everything we're doing, and everyone is bringing to the table what they do best. So AMC's creative people are looking at the scripts, looking at the dialogue for what's going on, giving comment about... Um, the, uh, like for instance, the weapons, um, they're well aware of what's in the season game now or in the current, current first and second season and also what's coming up and actively helping to shape and guide the game from a creative standpoint as far as their interpretation of, of this world. Um, the developer, Eyes Wide Game, is bringing their expertise when it comes to development of, of Facebook games. Um, they had also previously worked on things like um, the, um, the CSI game. And then Rocky, we've got a ton of experience when it comes to the viral part, the marketing part, and also the general product management, analytics, and the whole back end. And to some degree, we're also the people who know the most about development, and know most about working with uh, licensed entertainment and, and uh, advertising. So we can actually help bridge the gap, gaps uh, for the rest of the parties. So what about the game? Well, strong production values. I said before, games that are just meant to be marketing vehicles aren't going to work. This game has got really strong production values. It, it, is, I will, it will rival any game out there when it comes to depth and, and playability. Um, it does serve somewhat of a marketing purpose in that it's bridging the season uh, time between season two and, and season three. But frankly, that's almost an afterthought. It's not really the intent of it. Um, as far as AMC is concerned, and I love this about them, they want to make the best game they can. 
And I would encourage anyone, if you're going to work with a licensor, try to find one that that is the most important thing to them. A lot of people will say that, but here's an example of a company that actually steps up and, and meet, they mean it when, they, when they're talking about trying to help make the best possible game. And then finally, that, that affects the quality because we're partners on this. It's not a traditional license deal. We're partners on this. They are contributing to the quality of the game as well. All right, so here's a couple of little imagery that, that we're offering up around the game. You can see it follows some traditional Facebook sorts of um, approaches for, for art direction, and yet it's still consistent with, with the brand, brand itself. Um, all the show characters are inside the game. Our storyline is, um, for those of you familiar with the, the show, in season one, the, the, the large impetus is the, the, the group heading off to the CDC in Atlanta to find out what's really going on among, with the zombie uh, infestation. So our storyline is actually taking place as that begins. You are play, play a character in the game who is joined up with uh, Shane and Lori as they're making their way to Atlanta, and Rick's going to be following along afterwards, afterwards and meet it with you later on. So this is the story of the, that's, that travel as you're heading off to Atlanta, followed by, and then it will fold into to season two as well. And here's an example, for instance, of how we combine the, um, the, uh, the advertising with the, the, the digital goods component of it. Within the world of Walking Dead, ammo becomes very critical and it becomes very hard. In our game, it also becomes a limited resource, trying to get enough ammo for your weapons. And this is an example of how, if you wanted to, you could click on this video, you could click on this uh, link, you could watch a video and we'll, we'll give you a, a bullet. Now, you'd have to click on a lot of bullets to get a, to a lot, watch a lot of videos to get a lot of bullets, but that's partially driven by how, how badly you want to do that versus chunking, plunking down cash or just, just grinding your way through it. And it's these kind of elements that are sort of woven into, we know that bullets are, mean something particular inside the show, we know about their scarcity, so we know how it, mean, how it means something to the game itself. We're able to wind, you know, build in the advertising elements at the same time and not make it overly you know, intrusive to the overall experience. So why do you care? We'll start with, with developers and publishers out there. You know, there's a, original IP is risky. It's tough. I mean, Zing's out there doing it a lot, but frankly, it's a really tough business to try to launch something that's original out there. It's being more and more expensive to make these games, and they are, um, there's a lot of time and effort that goes in, in, into making them as well. And you know, to some degree, this allows you to experiment with new stuff with, when you're using a, a, a brand. Like when you see our Walking Dead game, you'll see a few concepts you haven't seen before, but they only make sense in the context of, of, the, of the zombie world it's, itself. Um, there's also a little bit of uh, increase the prominence of your team or your company. If you say you're work conjoined, you know, working in association with a large brand. Um, frankly, if I just walked up here and said, okay, I'm working on a zombie game, no one really would have cared very much, I don't think, or would have been surprised. But, you know, you say you're working on, you know, The Walking Dead, and it means something, just, just the essential association with the, with the IP itself. Um, reducing rising costs, this is a big one, really big one. We all know that costs are starting to skyrocket as far as user acquisition goes, and this is the great, great advantage of a well-known popular brand is that it just lowers your cost of acquisition. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of, of likes on our fan page for the game before the game's launched just because of, it's the, of the association with the brand and because the studio AMC is helping us drive our pre-interest in, in the game. And it's going to be a huge boon uh, when we launch the game. And then finally, I think having a lot of money inside the industry is actually good for it. Makes it more part of, the, uh, part of, sort of the pop culture industry as well, which I think helps elevate the industry as a whole. On the brand side, faster time to market. It takes a long time to make a console game. You want to, if you have something that you want to get involved with, you, you, there obviously it's going to be a lot easier if you're thinking in terms of a mobile product or a portable product or a Facebook product to, to, to have a high quality product in a short amount of time. These are the kind of platforms you're looking for. If you have a lot of time, sure, go make a 360 title uh, or in addition to it. But, Typically, you don't have that kind of lead time in the entertainment industry. So in these particular industries, you can make these kind of games and still have them high quality and not make uh, sacrifice, sacrifices you would have to on, a, on other platforms. Engagement, all the time. 
if you have a brand out there that's working, the people are constantly engaging with it, passing it, talking about it with friends, and this is exactly what you want if you're the uh, person behind you know, a popular uh, IP and having it constantly you know, among, the, among the topic of the uh, like water cooler conversation. And finally, money. I mean, I'll, I'll just do up some examples here of how you could do the math if you wanted to. But, you know, there's some serious money to be made. And, and the numbers I do up here are really more sort of between a, like a mid-core and a, and a sort of a casual game uh, ARPU. But, you know, we know there are some high, high, higher-end uh, core games that are doing ARPUs well north of, of 10 and even 15 cents. And it can deliver some really meaningful business. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll make that last pitch also to remind you guys that by associating with the advertising and the promotion along with it in a way that does not distract from the quality of the game is the way to make these, the P&Ls and the ROIs to, to really sing. Okay. So we have time for questions. Does anyone have any? Sure. Um, I disagree a little bit. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. I mean, no, I mean, like... Uh, if you think about like, if we, let's take the zombie game. You know. okay. Let's take a game like Plants vs. Zombie or Zombie Farm. Yeah. Do you think Walking Dead will, will get more players than, than this game basically invent their own IP? Yeah. The, the, uh, tell me if I misstate your question. The, the question is, if you take another game that has potentially has a, like a zombie theme, like, like Plants vs. Zombies and, or Zombie Farm, which I'm not as familiar with, uh, would, it have, uh, would it have the same, be just, as, be just as easy to attract? Is that what you're saying? My point is, is more like, I guess the gaming industry is going so big right now yes. that it would be able to invent new IP and make movie from this new IP than just oh, oh well, yes. I, 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 listen, I, I agree with you completely that the industry is big enough that some of these titles will ultimately become their own multimedia IP. Probably Angry Birds is a great example of how that could be translated into other ones. And I'm not saying that, that what, we're, what I'm talking about means that none of that will happen. It will, it will certainly happen. I'm saying on the side, though, this is a less risky way to happen. Let me, if you can do an original IP that works, do it. I mean, that is like a home run. <laughs> I mean, a lot of studios are going for this because the market is growing so much and open our games to so many new people and new target as the TV did the last 20 years. Right. Like, you know, like to get like this, this I don't know if my English is clear when I'm, so if you understand me, but like basically TV works because you get like, you get an audience who goes from uh, two years old to 90 years old. Yes. No mobile gaming and game on social gaming are getting the same audience. So why the next SpongeBob or Family Guys or Why would they come from it? Why, why won't, won't come first on mobile, like with, no, on mobile, sorry, because I work in mobile gaming. So on gaming in general. And then you're going to see like Hollywood saying like, okay, uh, why not let's do, let, let's do a movie with this. So well, I, I, I'm more like excited by this this move than the other. Right. Okay. Now, hold on a second. Just Let's talk about it a little bit. Like Let's talk sure. about it. Let's go back to the beginning of this thing. Okay. Well, that's part of the reason, right? Right? I mean, you're starting off with a disadvantage. The television networks and the, on television, they already have the audience there. On mobile, you don't have nearly as many eyeballs as they have. So their starting base to drive it is just bigger to, to begin with as far as, as far as size goes, right? In terms of time spent, in terms of breadth, how quickly they can grab it. I mean, trying to grab 9 million people in just that 30 minute time, that's hard on mobile, right? I mean, I don't see someone grab 9 million people that fast. So that's one reason. The other reason I think is because it just takes a while for new technology to sort of supplant other technology. Remember, looking at this thing for 50 years, TV has dominated this landscape. Or if you think about movies, going back almost 100 years, it's dominated what it does. And I think it just will take a while for these other, other, um, other you know, channels or basically platforms to be able to rise to the level they could even have a chance of supplanting them. But I think you will see things come out. I mean, you've seen a little bit more in console, I'd say, 
not particularly successfully, but, but you've yeah. seen some of them go the way um, and they become sort of cross-platform multimedia properties uh, more so than, than on, I've seen so far on either mobile or on, uh, on Facebook. But I, I think it will happen. I think it's possible. And I think they'll just coexist. Sure. The question is essentially, how do you deal with the issue that a, a licensor, if he's truly a partner, is so much more involved with the process that they will, could potentially slow down the process because they either have a lot of things that they want to sign off on or approval of, um, or have different views or visions of how it should go along the way. And no, that's, that's, a, that's a really fair point. I think that it's true of any, any creative exercise. When you put more people involved with it, it's just going to go slower if a lot more people have, have say in it. I would say that the, the counterbalance, though, for that is, and by the way, at Rocky, we, we build that in essentially to our expectations as far as the schedule, that, it will, that some things will take longer given that there's more people involved. But, you know, the, the, counter, the counterbalancing value of having the IP owner there actively helping you also makes it worthwhile, frankly, to have it take a little longer. It requires meetings to run longer. You have to explain more. There's a little bit more training involved, the explanations. There's more discussion. There's more analysis. All that's true. All that's true. But if you have the right licensor, it's worth it. Now, by the way, I used to work at the Walt Disney Company. I was uh, vice president of marketing for the, uh, the interactive group. The, the, so I approved lots of licensing stuff for, for Disney, which is kind of famous for having being very strict and, and difficult about this. I think the trick really is to pick partners that that share the sort of like the common beliefs you have and, and you believe you can work with strongly. It's possible if you pick up a licensor that's very difficult, and, and I have picked other ones, but I'm not going to name them, where I would never work with them again because I just know that even though they're very good at what they do when it comes to that particular medium they're on, whether it be TV or movie, that when it comes to other sorts of platforms, they are so restrictive and difficult that they end up sort of detracting from the actual creative experience of the game itself, and I find that you know, very you know, not worth the trouble if it's not actually going to be a good product. Not the case in the, in, in, as far as AMC goes, because they really get games. They really want to make great games. So this part, this time it's worked out really well. There are times it might not. Yep, oh, I only time for it. So anyone wants to come up, I'll chat with you. Thank you. <laughs>